Some of you will have seen Sean and me going wild around Bletchley Park and we'll deduce from that that we've paid a visit to BP, as they call it in the trade. It's time now for me to move off from the Enigma story, which I've done two or three videos on already, and tell a story that in many ways is even more relevant to the start of computer science than even Enigma was. We've all heard of Alan Turing, but I would suspect that Fewer of you have heard about Bill Tut, Max Newman, Tommy Flowers. But they're all worthy of hero status because they're all connected with a type of cipher traffic, mysterious cipher traffic, that came to Bletchley Park's attention. And at Bletchley was always called tunny traffic. They loved calling mysterious traffic by the name of fish. And there was things like sturgeon and halibut as well as tunny. But this one is going to be tunny traffic. Tunny is the original English word for what we nowadays call tuna. It's as simple as that. Even before the war, the Metropolitan Police and the Foreign Office jointly used to listen to the airwaves to see what was happening. You know, that shouldn't be happening within the UK shores. Anything mysterious. Now, an awful lot, of course, of what they were listening to was plain, straightforward radio broadcasts. Or, from the military point of view, it would be Morse code. Some of that Morse code might well be encrypted Enigma traffic, but it was in Morse. This one was weird. It wasn't in Morse. It sounded almost like a touch-tone telephone on steroids or something. Uh, it was meow, meow, all over the place. And so what they did was they equipped the listening stations that were all over the UK because they all knew that war was almost inevitable. They had a whole load of joint listening stations, and these listened for Enigma traffic. They also listened for anything unusual. They were called Y stations, capital Y, for reasons I don't understand. But there again, Bletchley Park was called Station X, and I don't understand that either. So these Y stations started saying, look, there's some weird stuff here. Would you like to see what it looks like? They were able to make a recording of the trace of this, as if it was an oscilloscope, but actually on a piece of paper. If you look here, it's like a waveform, and that is exactly what it is. And they were able to record this as a black trace. And when you look at it, it's like a mixture between a sort of sine wave and a square wave. But once they got the experts in looking at this, you've got to remember, teleprinters were very common. They were used in stock exchanges, they were used in telegraphy. A lot of traffic went over landline that was actually teleprinter code. This was broadcast because presumably the landline was too long between the far end of Greece and Germany, let's say. So it had to be broadcast. And the expert said, that's broadcast teleprinter traffic, that is. Now you know why Sean and I have set the scene by doing a video already on five hole paper tape codes, teleprinter alphabet, and even on exclusive all. The rule at the police and the foreign offices, anything mysterious like this gets sent to GCCS. And we remember from the previous videos, GC and CS, Government Code and Cipher School, Initially based in St. James's Park in London, the great majority of it moved off to Bletchley Park in the late 30s. So Bletchley Park was accumulating this stuff. Big debate. Is this a Vernum cipher? In the late 1920s, an American employee of AT&T had come up with the idea of doing secure, enciphered, teleprinter transmissions by doing what we would now call an exclusive OR between two 5-bit patterns. Yeah, great idea, because it would disguise the character you wanted to send. There's only one problem that, if you want to apply that to a whole message, how would you arrange to have, as it were, cipher key characters randomly chosen to mix in via exclusive OR with your plain text that you wanted to send and to send out the result. Well, what Vernon proposed, and to my amazement, he patented it, and he thinks this is madness. This is madness. This is secure. This, they shouldn't be patenting this stuff. It gives the game away. This is AT&T, and we're not at war yet. We're not having the competition coming up with this bright idea. This has got commercial potential, you know, as well as military. We're going to patent it. 
So Vernon patented the idea. It would use two five-hole tapes. And uh, what you could do is have this one, which is the plain text, running alongside this one, which has somehow been generated, and this is the key. This is the thing that's going to be exclusive ORD, character by character, with this, to give a cipher text. The problem is the enormous one. These things are driven by sprocket holes. You start trying to run two tapes simultaneously through a piece of bespoke electronics which they invented, which will do the merging. But you must keep them in exact sync. You do not want differential stretching between the two things. Worse still, when your supervisor says, this thing isn't going fast enough, we need more speed, and you speed it up, you know what happens next? The sprocket holes tear. And then you've got slippage like you never dreamed of in your worst nightmares. So as a result of all this problem of tape synchronization, it never really got to market. It was quietly abandoned, but the idea was good. But the people of Blessed Park started to say, is this a Vernum cipher that we were taught about at training school before we started here at BP. But maybe the Germans have been smart enough to say we're not going to use a second tape because you've got to be synchronised. We will provide the key characters from a machine. It'll be like an add-on to the teletype, the teleprinter. You type in your plain text character, this thing we'll invent, and it's probably going to have wheels, rotor wheels. Every good cipher machine has rotor wheels on it. Well, somehow, generate a five-bit international teletype letter and then it'll automatically exclusive or it um, <clears throat> and then we'll get an output and that'll be our cipher and the good thing is that it'll be a lot less problem to keep the machine in sync with what we're doing when you've only got one tape to worry about so in the end they discovered that that's exactly what was happening looked at more and more of this tunny traffic how on earth are we ever ever going to get into this stuff. At the start of this signal, it goes up high, but the rule in these intercepted messages that we'll put out on this piece of kit called the undulator is that if it's high, it's a zero, and if it goes low, it's a one, and the neutral point is somewhere in the middle. Let's just do a straightforward addition of two five-bit codes to see what it would look like. The letter A, capital A, in the international teleprinter code, the Bordeaux-Murray code, is 11000. And let me remind you, one of the approved signals for doing an exclusive OR operation is plus in a circle. I'm going to add that on via exclusive OR to the letter X. Letter X is 101. One, one. You all know how this works now. Exclusive OR gives a zero if they're the same and a one if they're different. Look that up in your table. What character is that? It's the letter V. So there we are, look. The plain text, shall we say, was A. The ciphering character given by the randomizing device was X. And this particular character is V. What we're going to have to do on this, surely, is to get enough evidence about that random key stream before we can start working out how the heck it works. Mathematicians were around and were upon the scene, arguably not as many as Bletchley Park really needed in the early days, to say, look, this is an example of what we in the mathematics trade call an additive ciphering system. It's doing arithmetic modulo, a certain number. This as I've said, is arithmetic modulo 2. It's binary addition, but without the carries. And some wise self said, do you know there are weaknesses in all additive ciphers? Basically, at the end of the 19th century, a man called Kirchhoff had uh, published a paper about cryptography via additive ciphers and said the problem with them all is if you accumulate enough captured cipher text, even when you don't know the key, but lots of different messages, if they're all done with the same key, you can eventually accumulate so much that via a clever trick, you can work out what the messages are without even knowing the key, because it kind of cancels out. And everyone says, oh, that could be helpful. So all we've got to look out for then is, are they using the same key for any of this stuff? Handy.
every single one of these transmissions, before it came through on the undulator, they all came with an indicator. Now this really puzzled them at first. I copied one down from my reference books. Those 12 characters would be sent out and then there'd be a pause and then this stuff the undulator traffic would start. However, there was sufficient of this sent out to train the operators that again the game was given away. The crypt analyst said, I wonder if that's in, in code or cipher itself. And so I well, I don't know. But you see, could this be like Enigma? They sent out blocks of three letters to show the settings, the initial settings. Could it be like that? And then somebody else would say, yeah, but there's 12 of them. That doesn't make sense. 10 would make sense. Two layers of encipherment, one after the other. First row of five, you know, five bits, and then push it on again to another one. But these could be settings of cipher wheels, just like Enigma. But how can we be sure that they aren't in a code of their own? Do, do they really mean what they say? <laughs> As part of the training scenario, obvious for the poor operators trying to work this machine, there were some of the transmissions that said in clear, M ist Michael, G ist Gerhard, <laughs> right? So by the time you've got O is Otto, K is Carl, right? You can see this is training operators. Yes, it's K for Carl. You see the K and you wind the cipher way around to you see the letter K, K for Carl. And by the fact that they had elaborated in the training all of these as uh, boys' first names made the listeners sure that these were what they seem. So the answer now is very clear. We have to sit and wait patiently. We have to ask our Y stations to rigorously send us exactly what the indicator was. And if we wait long enough, somebody will use the same indicator twice. Absolutely against standing orders, but it was known from Enigma that this was a great temptation in the heat of battle with people shouting at you, you use the same settings twice. It's all right, nobody will be listening. <laughs> oh yes, they are. This did happen, I guess you could say, sooner rather than later. I think it was August 1941. They finally got a message which had got the same indicator. And they knew perfectly well that with that, when a lot of hard, patient work, because there were no computers to help you, nevertheless, we could probably disentangle this message. Now, another thing, these messages seem to be going between headquarters of the German High Command. These were not between weather stations. They were not even between Luftwaffe stations. This was serious stuff. This was going from Athens HQ to Berlin HQ, shall we say. Clearly this stuff, and there wasn't much of it initially, was going to be used by the high ups, the German High Command. And as we now know, it really was Hitler's favorite cipher machine. Its great advantage, unlike Enigma, was that it was user friendly. You know what Enigma's like. You need a person to punch the thing, a person to read the lamps, a person to send the Morse code. Here, you could connect two encrypted type teletypes back to back across a landline or even across the airwaves, although that would be a bit dicey to do with interference. But you could, in principle, have your operators never see the ciphertext. It goes in one end, enciphered, across, deciphered, out it comes. Therefore, because it's easy to use and user-friendly, people will send longer messages. And that's music to the ears of the Cryptanalyst Brigade. They love that. By this stage, the listeners had decided that we need a new Y station separately for this tunny traffic. Remember, the traffic was called tunny. The machine that was generating it was called German tunny, or just tunny. The machines that eventually they built at Bletchley Park, once they understood how it worked, to do the same job of deciphering was called British Tunny. But it was all Tunny, you know what So here was this Tunny traffic, all stacking up, all waiting to be decrypted, all waiting for two or more to be sent out with the same key. Now, at Bletchley, technically that's called a depth. Getting a depth means you've got two or more uh, messages all with the same key, absolutely against standing orders, because the German cryptographers had warned the military, this one, this kind of XOR additive cipher, is even more sensitive to depths 
probably even an enigma. With the enigma, you only got a short message out anyway because life's too short to send much more than about 50 characters. This thing, in the end, they got 4,000 characters worth. And then, when they said, when the chap phoned back to them and said, sorry, <coughs> uh, didn't quite get that, could you send it again? My first thought was, surely the sender guy would have had the sense to make a tape of it and to send it offline in the first place. No, we hadn't. He typed it in by hand without making a copy. So when it was sent again, you can imagine the sender muttering and cursing. He used abbreviations, he made it shorter. And as we'll see, next time, that made the deciphering job even easier. Zero, zero, two, one, and so on. And the, the important thing about this is, by doing this, we're going to get a huge list of noughts all in a row. And that is very easily compressed by Huffman Encoding. Most of our volunteers have been building the circuits at home, on kitchen tables, in garden sheds.